Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for being here. We're going to go ahead and get started. Thanks for bearing with us for a few minutes while we had some technical difficulties. Um, my name is Margo and I'm the events coordinator at the Hub City Bookshop in Spartanburg, South Carolina. We're so excited to have you all join us tonight for a virtual conversation with Lo Patrick, author of the debut novel, The Floating Girls. Oh, that's not it. The Floating Girls. <laughs> Library, the reason why I have this other book I'm about to say, Library Journal's review called this novel classic Southern girlhood fiction with a twist, which I thought was just such a beautiful way to describe it. Um, and also compared it to Hub City Press's very own recent publication, The Crocodile Bride um, by Ashley Bell Peterson, saying that anyone who was a fan of this book would also be a fan of The Floating Girls. And I thought it was just so lovely to see those books be in company with each other. And we are over the moon at Hub City Bookshop to have the author of this gorgeous book here with us today. Lo will be in conversation with Ashley Blooms, whose most recent book, Where I Can't Follow, was released to a lot of anticipation and success earlier this year. Lo and Ashley, thank you both for being here. Before I hand it over to the authors, I just want to quickly introduce our bookshop for anyone who might not be familiar with us. We're an independent bookstore in Spartanburg, South Carolina, serving all of the upstate community, but we're also a nonprofit. And our mission is to cultivate readers and nurture writers. And one of my favorite things that we do to cultivate readers is these author events where we bring in authors of wonderful, wonderful books, often books about the South, and have conversations like this. So if you want to find out more about us or about upcoming events like this one, please head to our website, hubcity.org, and sign up for our newsletter. Also, if you've not yet purchased your copy of the books, um, please know you can click the button at the bottom of your screen. There should be a green button that says buy the books. That will take you to our online shop where we have beautiful brand new signed copies of The Floating Girls and also copies of Ashley's books as well for sale there. Um, we can ship them anywhere in the world that you are. So please, um, please buy the book from us. It's one of the best ways to support the Writers Project. And you can, of course, also buy The Crocodile Bride from us as well if you find yourself wanting to just binge Southern girlhood summer fiction after tonight's event. One final thing before I introduce our authors, please feel free to ask questions. You can drop them in the chat at the side of your screen. You should be able to maximize it. Um, or there's an ask a question button at the bottom of your screen. You can drop them there. We'll save a little bit of time for the authors to answer questions. So please um, don't be shy, ask your questions. Without further ado, I'm gonna introduce our authors. Lo Patrick is a former lawyer and current novelist living in the suburbs of Atlanta. The Floating Girls is her debut novel. Ashley Blooms is the author of Where I Can't Follow, which was named a most anticipated novel by Good Housekeeping, Gizmodo, and Tor.com, among others. Her debut, Every Bone of Prayer, was long listed for the Crook's Corner Book Prize. Learn more at her website, ashleyblooms.com. Lo and Ashley, I'm going to turn it over to, to both of you, you. and yes, I'm going to minimize, minimize myself. myself. Thank, Thank you so, you so much. much. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here with you, Lo, to talk about The Floating Girls. Um, I wanted to start by just asking how the book release is going. How are, you know, how are things? Um, things are great. And thank you, Matt. Oh, I'm getting the really, 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 really are you getting about it? A little bit, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Just, just a heads up. I can probably, probably work. I don't know if anybody else is getting it. Um, the book, the book release is going really well. It's kind of surreal. I'm sure you remember when you had one come out. Um, I think I finally get to say rather than when people ask me, how's the writing going? Which for about 11 years, I would just, it's great. And there, do you have a book coming out? No. Now I finally get to say, yes, I actually have a book out. And that's been the biggest thrill for me is that there's something tangible to show for the years of kind of quiet solitary work, which I'm, I'm sure that you can relate to that. So the launch has been fun and um, lots of lots of fun support from local shops around here. One that I've really never spent time in is now a, a favorite Foxtail in Woodstock, Georgia. I mean, I like wandered in there a couple times, but we did something there and now I'm just hooked. 
Uh, so it's been great. Thank you. Um, I'm just just trying to enjoy every second of it and appreciate every second of it and do all the things I'm supposed to do. So because I'm new at this. So <laughs> yeah, learning. Yeah, learning. Yeah. No, I think that I totally get that feeling. It's always nice when all of those years finally like are something that you can hold and share with people and it it goes by really fast so i think you you're in the right frame of mind to just try to enjoy every bit of it that you can yeah, yeah. hoping to thank you, thank you. <laughs> so the floating girls is your debut novel which is honestly hard to believe because it's just so good you know it's one of those books that you're reading you're like i cannot believe this person hasn't been writing for just years and I wonder if you could tell us just a little bit about the book's journey. So sort of when you started writing the book and how it's changed over time. Um, well, I have been writing for a very long time and I probably did the first iteration of this book, I would say maybe six years ago. Um, and then I kind of moved on from it and went back to it, moved on from it, went back to it. And um, when my agent and I decided this was the one we were going to submit, uh, we, you know, really dug into it and it did change quite a bit, but Kay, the narrator has always been, there are parts of it have never changed, but there's been some stuff that's come in and out and, you know, it came out, it went back in, it came out again. And, uh, we finally, I don't know, in a great spot. And then my editor read it and she, you know, connected with it. And it was just like a, like the clouds opened and the sun came down. So it, it's an older book for me. I've written a bunch of stuff since then, but uh, it was always very special to me. Um, I enjoyed being K while I was writing a lot. So it was very easy to go back and work on it because I just, I liked her. I liked writing like her, I liked thinking like her. So um, it was a fun journey. I'm sure you can relate. Sometimes you work on stuff that's just not it's a little bit more like you're grinding it out and and especially to go back and edit that can feel like, you know, I should just move on from this. But this, I never felt like that. I was always kind of, oh, I get to go be Kay again. And, you know, she'd make me laugh. I mean, I, I wrote it, but I thought she was funny, too. So <laughs> she she is hilarious, I think. Um, and yeah, I, I totally relate to that. I think, you know, when I was revising my books, there would be parts that would move in, move back out. And that was always one of the the harder things is like how many versions of your book you actually hold in your head at once and trying to to come fresh to the page when you are doing revisions can sometimes be difficult because there there's so much history that you carry with you. Yeah, and yeah. I battle with like doing more harm to the book by editing. I've I've always like, you know, is it one of those things where I just need to leave it alone? Um, and let somebody else look at it. Um, but me going back in and out and in and out of my taking out stuff that should stay. That's always where I start to get, you know, a little bit like diminishing returns, um, the heavier handed edi editing I'm doing. But yeah. Yeah, I, it's hard sometimes to hold on to that objectivity when you're in it, because it's, it's hard to see the forest for the trees, you know, yeah. when you're when you're really in the thick of, of editing and revising. But I mean, obviously, the result is gorgeous. So it turned out well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I always wonder with authors if there are any characters that are that were sort of harder than others or any characters that gave them problems. And maybe that comes from me. Sometimes there's always just like one one seed that just is so difficult to sort of wrap my head around or to sort of figure out. So were there any characters in your novel that were a little more challenging than others? Definitely. Um, because I wanted, in spite of how awful her father is, I wanted there to be some, you know, that is her father. And, you know, there's, you hear a lot of people talk about, well, I don't get along with my mother and you're like oh but, but she's my mother so i mean that's still Kay's father there had to be something redeeming there he couldn't I mean, he was pretty awful but he couldn't i wanted to capture that she had at some point some awe of him and that she did see him as a father figure even though she was disappointed and so i did i did struggle with exactly how to portray that um i wanted her to be very rebellious you know toward her situation while still still, you know, she's still living in that house. She's, you know, he's still an authority figure. And, um, you know, every once in a while he would be kind to her or kind of pause, you know, his, his depressive 
ways and connect with her. Uh, so that was difficult. I, I, you know, that I don't have that kind of relationship my, with my parents. I really have great relationships with my parents. So it's hard to write something where, you know, there was so much dysfunction at home. Um, but especially with the dad, because I, I did want them to connect more. Um, you know, it's hard to make them connect when, you know, she's sassing him and he's, you know, throwing stuff at her. And so that, that was a little tricky, I thought. Yeah, that writing that kind of character can be like a real tightrope. Um, I know, especially like when you're writing from a child, like, because they, I mean, they will still love their parents and need their parents and be drawn to their parents, even as they are maybe also pushed away by their parents' behavior, or by some of the sort of dysfunction in the home. And so it's, it's hard to kind of strike that balance. But I feel like you did. I feel like the every character has moments where you can understand them. And that's really like, I think the best thing we can do is help our try to understand each of our characters and how they became who they are. And I feel like that comes through in, in the novel. Oh, thank you. So that's what I, I, I know some of it's very dark and I've had people say like, well, it's just very depressing. And I'm like, but it is reality. I mean, you know, that is how a lot of people are living. I mean, I, we, we hate it, but, um, and they have happy moments and they have days where things are going well and, Yes, I, I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, of course. And yeah, I've I've heard the same before the about the darkness, but I feel like it's important to bring, yeah, that honesty to the page. Because I mean, it is, this is how life happens and it is how some people's stories unfold and to look at that with empathy, you know, instead of sort of voyeurism, like that's the best I think that we can do. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, yeah. Uh, so Kay, obviously, um, is an incredible narrator. She is really memorable as a character. Um, am I muted? No, okay. <laughs> um, but she, like, I know that I'm going to carry her with me for a very long time. Like, she cracked me up. And in the way that, that child narrators, I feel like, have a specific um, ability to do, there were moments where she was hilarious, but also in a turn just heartbreaking because of her age and her innocence and the position she was in. And I just wonder how you went about capturing her voice. And was it ever challenging to sort of go back to the perspective of a 12 year old? Well, no. And I don't know what that says about me. I don't know. <laughs> I'm just profoundly immature, but no, I did not. I did not struggle with her. Um, I kind of always knew what she was going to say or what she was going to think or how, how she would take it, like her relationship with the police officer who investigates. I could really like see how she would be sitting in there with him and kind of only thinking about snacks and stuff and not, you know, just not really understanding the gravity. Um, I did not struggle with, with thinking like her and, you know, they, I've heard that authors often write in a voice or a time that was very significant to them. And I can't really think about, I don't know that 12 was particularly significant for me that that doesn't stand out in my mind but i think you know some of the confusion of that age i can remember uh vividly and i was yeah i carried some of that confusion you know a long time well into adulthood about just how things work and why why things are the way they are and why people are in situations that they're in so um i definitely remember feeling a little bit bewildered throughout my adolescence, but not, um, not quite like Kay, but yeah, I, I, she never gave me trouble. She was, she was my, my pal during the writing. Like I said, she kind of, she kind of made it easy to get back to. So, yeah. I love that. Uh, and I found with my, like my community or my, my writer friends that there is a kind of, um, yeah, they'll be drawn to certain age ranges. For me, it's always like the more middle grade. So like 10, 11, 12 is like the, the younger voice I'm drawn to. I've never had like a teenage character show up or a teenage sort of story that I've wanted to tell. And I know that when I think back on it, 12 was a big year as far as reading went for me. And sort of the books that I found when I was around that age really had a profound impact on me. And I think that was probably the time I started kind of thinking about writing and like, you know, loving it as much as I do now. Was that similar for you? Um, I think, I mean, I'm trying to, 12 would have been like seventh grade. 
Yes, I think I, that would be a time I more came into my own. There's a little independence that comes from you start deciding how you want to act, not necessarily, you know, how you've been. I, I don't know, you're moving into middle school and there's a little bit of freedom. Other people are kind of, you know, branching out and maybe doing some things they shouldn't do. And there's a lot of appeal when you're younger. You know, the rebellious crowd is very appealing. And I can remember... Um, being intrigued more with the world around me at that age. So probably with books as well. I can't think of anything specifically, but I can remember being a little bit more engaged in what was going on around me rather than just such an insular, you know, with my family and like at home. And you know, I was like kind of looking outward a lot more by that time. And uh, so that probably had some significance. I'll have to go back and think of what I was reading at that time. Um, Nothing is coming to mind, but I'm going to have to, nothing significant. So that would be, that would be yeah. I would like to know what I was reading then. Oh. No, I think you're, you're right though, with the sort of that tension at that age is really sort of the beginning of that kind of differentiation, like becoming a singular person as opposed to like a part of a group, a part of your family. And there's a lot of of tension there, you know, and a lot of, I think, fear and uncertainty is, you know, as you kind of begin to sort of step away from um, kind of what you've always known and kind of, yeah, take on, you know, your personality starts to change and develop, which yeah, actually yeah. Uh, fits really well with my next question, which is that, you know, this is kind of a coming of age story for Kay in many ways. Um, and I feel like that type of story is one that is just always captivated readers and writers. It's, you know, one of the sort of the big story forms that we return to is that sort of that sort of tender fraught period of, of kind of coming into yourself. And I wonder what drew you to sort of that time period or telling the story of a young girl like Kay. I, I really don't know, and that's not a great answer for a <laughs> discussion among writers, but um, I do tend to write like by the seat of my pants, like I've heard somebody call it a pant, are you a pantser or a, a and so I um, will just sit down and just start writing, and I just, I just started writing as K, and it just continued, I didn't get bored of it, I didn't want to move on to anything else, I didn't get tired of her. So I think it was more of just a, she had perseverance where maybe other narrators had failed, like someone someone else I wasn't enjoying writing as much or I didn't find as likable um, because I really like Kay. And I know she's sassy. I know she's, you know, she's spouting off all kinds of stuff, but I liked her and I, I really empathized with her and connected with her. And um, so as the, the coming of age aspect of it, I mean, I didn't see how she couldn't grow up a little bit going through what she did. And her brothers do too. I, I wanted to portray that her brothers also, because she hasn't, you know, they're older and they're, you know, going to be even maybe more affected by it because especially her, her oldest brother, because he really is in a, a time and place where he could just move on. And, um, so I thought it would be interesting, more interesting to have a young person going through that because of the confusion that would surround a young person going through that rather than adult would be angrier or more demanding of answers, or it would be more like procedural. Why aren't they doing this? I kind of liked the idea that um, the reader would be learning it the way she was learning it about her family history and all these things coming up. So maybe not quite as um, perfect. It was a little, a little messy because that's how young people learn things. That's how they learn about life. And we all learn, we all learn about life through mistakes and you know, ours and other people's, but young people really learn about life that way. So, yeah. Yeah, definitely. And I think, I mean, Kay is, she's loud. She can be like a little abrasive sometimes, but there's also like one of the lovely things about reading um, sort of an adult book with a child narrator is that we as the reader bring so much understanding um, that the child does not have. And so like there were moments when Kay is at the dinner table and she just will not stop talking. And <laughs> she is just like, you know, even as the tension and the family is like ratcheting higher and higher. And like when I read those scenes, I just see her trying to be heard and trying to connect. And there's such a and that's one of those those things about, yeah, having a child narrator is that 
there's such tenderness even in those moments when they're being really bratty or really loud is that you know you can kind of see as an adult like what would drive them to that point and you just I there were so many times where I just wanted to like take her out for an ice cream or like take her fishing and just be like I will spend some time with you honey <laughs> she would appreciate it she needed you Ashley <laughs> oh god uh you mentioned Kay's siblings which is um one of my favorite things about writing I think you know kind of like how I'm drawn to middle grade age I'm also drawn more to sibling relationships than I am to like romantic relationships or things like that like that's where a lot of my attention will go and I just love portrayals of siblings in fiction and I feel like Kay and her brothers and her sisters that they you did such a fantastic job of showing like the the love and the hate and how one will turn very quickly into the other just at the drop of a hat and also the protectiveness and the disdain like all of the mixed feelings um and especially like with children growing up where there are limited resources and you do kind of compete for resources you know you compete not just for like the things but for time and attention and i think all of that comes out without minimizing like the care that they have for one another and I just I just love that and I wonder how you sort of envisioned Kay's relationship with her siblings and went about making such a big cast where everyone feels very distinct well thank you Ashley um I'm glad that that was successful for you um it was really important part of the book because one thing that's was crucial to the story is that they were so isolated that they really did not, you know, they went to school, but they were living out, you know, kind of in the middle of nowhere in a town that was in the middle of nowhere, but they were even more isolated than that. And they were all they had. And so, you know, this was her, her entire world. And as much as she might've thought that she was, you know, they were annoying or, you know, he was a know-it-all or all these things that can be so frustrating with people that you spend too much time with, whether they're siblings or, or not, just somebody you've gone on a long vacation with or something where it's like all of their little nuances um, are front and center. So that it was important because of the isolation. She really didn't have anybody else to bounce anything off of. And so they needed to be big characters in the book. And she is young and they are very important super significant um especially given her parents kind of disinterest and apathy and sort of this wandering kind of days like thing her parents had going on the brothers would become even more important and you know she wasn't the nicest to sarah ann because she didn't understand and she was never was never explained what was going on there and um you know i know she she cared about her and she felt bad that she didn't feel more strongly, you know, about taking care of her. Um, so I think that in order to convey the extreme isolation they were living in, that's why I made the, the siblings such an important part of the book because uh, they would be important if you really had no one else to turn to ever for anything. For any reasons. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think, it's great to show too, like, because Kay doesn't have, you know, she's still forming that sort of idea of the world and of self. And so she, she ends up turning to her siblings more often to actually, and gets more, I think, input and feedback and, and response from her siblings, but they're also quite young. And so I think it's, it's interesting to think about how children actually form their ideas about the world. And a lot of it does come from other children, especially about things that they either can't or into are uncomfortable to talk to their parents about. So it really, you know, their reactions really help shape Kay, I think. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And they help her through, you know, this mess. They, they seem to know a little bit more about what's going on and that bothers her, but then in a way they're kind of protecting her and, you know, trying to not drag her further into it because she's little. She's the little one that they're, you know, as much as it, nobody's really taking great care of anybody there. They are taking better care of her. Yeah. So. Yep, definitely. And just a reminder, if anyone has any questions, feel free to drop them in the chat box or use the ask a question down at the bottom of the screen. Um, so. One of the other uh, things that really stood out to me about the floating girls was the setting. So the book takes place in Georgia and there are so many small, precise details 
um, that really made that place feel like another character almost. It felt it had such a, an immediate presence, right? The, the heat and even like the times when Kay would get into the water or them swimming together. And it was just and the I still have there's so many little details that it felt so, so alive. Uh, and I wondered if you do you think of sort of Georgia as a character in this book? And how did you kind of approach bringing it to life? Well, I definitely wanted the heat to be a character in the book because we have just such extreme summers here and it really, you don't understand it until you're here, until you spend a summer here. And um, I'm from the Atlanta area, which is hot enough, but this is down the Georgia coast and it is just absolutely beautiful, but it is a bug infested, <laughs> humid swamp of a, you know, it's, it's beautiful, but you really have got to have some grit to get through summers there. And um, I don't think Southerners give themselves enough credit for how we handle the heat. A lot of people live in cold climates, you know, they can, they're shoveling snow and they're, but we, we handle some tough stuff too. So the heat, I really wanted to be a character. And then, yeah, the, that area of the state just um, drives me crazy. Cause I just think it's, it's just magic. There's something, there's something in the air there, a, like a feeling that I don't have anywhere else in the world that I've been. This thickness, this droopiness, this um, lazy, meandering way of thinking and talking and doing. And so, yes, it was really important um, for her story to happen in that setting. I don't think it would have been the same story anywhere else, not even where I'm from. Um, it needed to be down there. And, and I've spent a lot of time down there. And um, so, yeah, I think that the setting was crucial to this particular story. And I'm, you know, I'm hoping I've, I've always wanted to write something about up in the mountains, the, the Georgia mountains, North Georgia. And, you know, I'm hoping that I'd be able to capture that. Um, like I think that I captured down on the, the coast, but we'll see. I'm going to have to give it a go. <laughs> you, you, you do the, the setting very well too. And you, um, yeah, you should pat yourself on the back for some of the stuff you just said to me. Cause I remember all of that from reading your, and I read your book quite a while ago. So yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah. I think I've lived in Mississippi for five years and I've only ever lived in Kentucky before that. And the heat was definitely, it was just different. I always tell like when trying to explain it to people who have never lived sort of in the deep South is that I left the apartment one day and I walked out of like the air conditioning feeling fine. I turned and locked the door. And just by the time I'd locked the door to leave the house, I was covered in like a sheen of sweat. Like only that small action had, and you, you really just have to kind of like, I don't know, give yourself over to it in a way. <laughs> like how you kind of like learn to, to move through it. And I feel like on Twitter, there have been conversations about how to deal with heat. And it's made me think so much about um, my time in Mississippi and about your book. And just like there's, yeah, it's it's not easy to make it through a day when it's that hot and muggy. Yeah, yeah and it's, um, as we say, I'd rather be sweating than shivering. And so we just kind of go with it. We just go, well, then we're lucky that, you know, I'm, I'm lucky it's hot. And it, and it gets cold here too, but not not cold like other places but yeah you just you got to embrace it i always say i love the heat because i it's like a part of me um having grown up in it and when i lived other places that didn't have summers like that always felt like something was missing you know it just that it envelops you and it it becomes part of you um you know we live there live in the on the earth in the in nature so it i mean it's a part of everyday life and everyday experience i feel like it's really important so yeah i definitely relate to that i mean for me it's more geography it's the mountains the thing that sort of really stands out and like you know where i grew up we were about 45 minutes from like a walmart there was just there was nothing like it was just hollers and creeks and mountains and for yeah and it was and when I think about it, I'm like, yes, it was annoying. You know, it was frustrating, but also like what the exchange was, you know, in order to to live there and to be in that much beauty and stillness and the kind of quiet that can exist. And like, you know, there's no feeling 
that really competes with like sitting on the porch and we lived in a little holler and you could watch the wind move in a circle around the trees all around you. And so it was just this feeling of being held. And now when I, like when I went moved to Mississippi, I was just like, I got a little weirded out. Cause I'm like, where are the mountains? What did they do? Well, <laughs> where have they gone? Like it's so flat and yeah. expansive. It's such a different feeling. Yeah, well, I, I you gave me chills with what you're talking about. We it's hilly up north too, and I uh, I love that. There's a it's a completely different feeling and um, than than being down on the coast. But um, they're very distinct and they're they're crucial to your if you're gonna you know be there and tell a story there. You gotta you gotta capture it. I think so. Absolutely, yeah, and I think you did a fantastic. I look forward to you writing about hills and mountains. I think that's going to be really exciting. Well, thank you. I hope I hope I can. I hope I do it. <laughs> so, um, yeah, sort of bouncing off of what we said, like, you know, I set basically everything I've ever written is set in Kentucky where I grew up. And I wonder sort of what draws you to writing about Georgia and are there any sort of highs and lows to writing about the place where you live and you love? Are there any sort of benefits or challenges to it? Yes, definitely. Um, and I'm a huge Kentucky fan. So a, as you know, I've spent some time there. So I, that, I also very much enjoyed that. Um, but uh, yes, there are. I don't know that I can do, you know, I grew up kind of suburban Atlanta. I'm not sure I can do that because I don't know. I don't know if I've got too much of an opinion of it or and, and a favorable one. I love it, but I don't know if it's too, too close. Um, I found that doing some place that's home, I've spent a ton of time there and it's down the road, but I don't live there. It was a little bit easier. I was, it was easier for me to be an observer. And I feel like the mountains are, I also, we spend a lot of time there. I don't live there. So I can observe a little, I'm more objective. Um, cause I've tried to write things kind of with more of a local feel like the Atlanta. And I'm, I'm never really happy with how it comes out. Um, it's just not as authentic. Uh, maybe because I'm overthinking it because, it, you know, I have too many personal experiences that I can't escape me and get into somebody else around here. Um, but when I lived, you know, I, I lived in various parts of the country and I was always surprised at how proud I was to be a Southerner. Not that I didn't think I was proud, but I would just like people would ask me where I was from and, you know, Georgia and like was really, um, I've always been very proud of it. And so when I when I was writing, I do find that everything I really like that I've written is set in the South um, because it's one of my characters. Just uh, like I've, I've said before, I don't think these stories can take place other places. They wouldn't be the same. The characters would be different. Um, the vibe would be different. So I do like to write about Georgia. I do. I really do. And it's, it's a, to me, it's such an underrated state. I just feel like people don't even know all there is here. And um, it's just a wash in beauty and it's every type of topography. It's just really, it's great. Yeah. It is a beautiful state. My, my partner was um, born in Savannah and oh. lived there. That's where we got engaged was in Savannah. Mm -hmm. It's my first time being in like near marshes. So it was very strange. It was like when we got engaged, there was, we were sort of near a marsh. And there were these little tiny crabs that were, it appeared that they were like worshiping almost the stick. They were sort of raising and lowering their claws. So it's, it has a particular um, soft spot in my heart for those well, reasons. I didn't, know that. I didn't know that. Yeah, well, this Savannah is our, um, part of my heart is in Savannah. And we spend a lot of time there and not enough. Um, but everything around it is. is just, and on up the coast into South Carolina. We've done a lot of, a lot of exploring up. That way too. It's just, uh, it's just magic. You feel like it's a secret. I always feel like it's, it's a hidden secret. If there'd be thousands of people around me everywhere I go, but I feel like they just, they're not, in, they're not quite in on the secret. Uh, so. Yeah. I, I know that feeling. I think when I write about home, I'm like similarly um, sort of drawn to that of like wanting to share, you know, my vision of home, my version. Cause I'm like, I don't think y'all see it exactly the way I see it. I want to help y'all see like Southeastern Kentucky and the magic and strangeness and beauty that exists there. Are there any things that 
you hope people take away from your work or any sort of ideas about Georgia that they kind of walk away with? Well, this, I mean, you know, I made blood so up, so I don't, you know, I don't want people to think <laughs> that it's all blood. So, um, because it's, it's certainly not, um, but maybe the connection with nature, I think that certain places get a reputation for being outdoorsy or these people are big hikers or these people are, you know, they sail. And I don't know that I think anywhere in the South gets a particularly outdoorsy reputation. And I just think that's totally false because I think like um, I spent my entire childhood literally barefoot and like in out in it. And I feel as an adult that I am so much more connected to nature here than I was in other places where I've lived that might've had more of a reputation for being like an outdoorsy kind of person's, you know, place to live. So um, I would hope that people would, if they've overlooked the natural beauty in Georgia or the South generally, I would hope that they would maybe try to go and find it. Uh, Cause it's there. And once you find it, it's so rewarding. It's such a rewarding, it's maybe not the same as, I mean, we have mountains here, but it may be not the same as looking at like the Alps or something that would just immediately, but um, it's the payoff is huge. When you, when you take the time, like you said, like look at the crabs and get down in the dirt and uh, you know, feel the moss. And there's so much growing here constantly that, you know, you can spend an hour and two square feet and, and then really see a lot. Oh. I love that. Just just hearing it makes me want to go back to to Georgia because it is it's a beautiful place. And I feel like, you know, I grew up with um, a kind of connection to nature. And if there's, I think that's one of the things that I am most grateful for as an adult was that relationship that I got to have with being outside and and sort of the the respect I think that you know I felt for the world and. There's something about being outside that really can remind you in a very loving, but also um, sometimes abrupt way of how small you are, you know, that you are just one part of um, the world and that it's, you know, that it is much larger and, and deeper than, than maybe we can feel when we're at home, you know, doing our jobs and all of that, that, you know, there's an expansiveness that being outside can bring. Yeah, perfectly stated, Ashley, perfectly stated. That was beautiful. Yes, exactly. And just that. I don't know, just that connection with the small and the large, you know, the sky is the largest thing. And then you look down, there's a little ant and it just kind of, it puts everything into perspective, everything that you're experiencing. It's really, it's special. So um, I would encourage people, I mean, we're talking to folks in South Carolina, so they know, but if anyone has not ventured even further over or down or in or wherever, um, you know, there's, there's just so much to see. There's so much to experience. And Kentucky, too, my, one of my faves. Uh, so I know as a writer, there are some themes and images that I I know that just kind of keep showing up in my work. They're almost like, you know, a little knot that I keep trying to untangle or something that I love. Um, like there's always something about dust in my work. You know, I think we lived on a dirt road and I think maybe it's just so ingrained in me the way the dust would rise and fall anytime that, you know, a truck would drive by. That, that just, it always appears sort of dust, dirt kind of keep showing up in my work. And it becomes, I think, kind of a hallmark. I know the reason that I return to writers sometimes is because it's like, they're so good at doing family stories or they're so good at doing like, you know, certain kinds of plots. And I wonder if you see any of those fascinations in the floating girls or any themes that you feel like you're going to keep coming back to? That's really interesting because I've been going through some other stuff that I've written and I'm doing a lot of editing right now. And so I have been, you, I've been seeing some recurring like sass and female characters and that, you know, I, Kay kind of does it perfectly. So I, you know, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to top her in that, but I have noticed, you know, apparently I want to write about these these female characters who are just like going off on everybody. So that is the, for better or for worse, that's a recurring theme. And I think it's, it's, you know, I'm being kind of tongue in cheek. I think it's this kind of like needing to be heard and, you know, wanting people to recognize you and understand what you're saying and what you're about. And I, I do think that I um, have found I'm writing quite a bit about that or someone going through, 
um, a powerful experience and coming out the other side is another thing that I'm seeing a lot of. Um, and I do really, really, really love to read about and write about interpersonal relationships. Just, I mean, I could read a 500 page book about a conversation. You know, I, I just, the, the, the things between people and the way that they communicate them or don't communicate them and the feelings and the kind of misunderstandings and, um, I think that is something that I love as a reader and hopefully can put into my own work. So yeah. I think you do that very well. And I, you know, there's always, there's so much happening in a conversation, you know, there's all, there's so much there that's present. Um, even if it's not being said. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so my last question is that now that we are all huge fans of your work and that we, we love the floating girls and can't wait for more um, opinionated, loud female <laughs> characters. I can't get enough of those. Okay. <laughs> so I hope they're, they're like, because they're, they're keeping up. <laughs> I'm glad to hear that. But so can you tell us a little about what you're working on now or what you have planned for the future? Well, that's, I mean, like I said, that's kind of interesting because I've gone back and um, there's three um, projects. One I wrote while we were going through all the editing and stuff with the Floating Girls um, that I really like. And I, another one that I, I continue to go back to over and over and over again that I don't feel like it's still at like 75%. And then another one that I think will probably be what I present to um, my agent and beyond as because I think it it's the most um, put together and I, I, I'm very pleased with the story. And I, once again, I really, I love my narrator and, um, but I, like I said, I really would like to do something up North. So I'm going to, it's going to be, I look up and these are all set in the North, the Northern part of the state in the foothills. And um, I would like to capture that. I would really like to capture it. And I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to die trying so, but it's an, um, female narrators, all three are female narrators and, um, they all have a mystery element to them. I like my mystery to be kind of tapping on your shoulder, not slapping you in the face. I like just it there and leading you through the story. But, um, so they all have that. And, um, but the, the narrators are all of different ages. So, um, so that kind of vague answer, but I have, I'm not, between these three that I'm kind of bouncing around between, I'm not quite sure what I think. I think I know the one that'll be next, but I don't want to. I don't give too much away because because they're not they're not totally done, as you know. Yeah, that's very really exciting though. I yeah. think that all. I'm looking forward to what comes next. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Ashley. Is Margaret one? Hi, can you hear me? <laughs> I didn't see your microphone, so I was, I was trying. I was, yeah, I was muted, trying to keep everything without an echo. Um, thank you guys so much for that wonderful conversation. We do have a question in the box, um, so I'm going to pose it um, to Lo and then also to Ashley as well. And it's, what is your typical writing process if you have? a typical writing process. Um, we often have a lot of aspiring writers in the audience, so any insights um, you can give would be awesome. You or me first, Ashley. Okay, you, you're, you're still muted. I'll go ahead and go. Um, I write every day, and I've always treated it as a job, not a job like I don't like, like I don't, you know, clock in or something, but I do have to do it every single day, and I have to, like, make progress every day or I'll just work before I go to bed, which is actually my favorite time to work, but I have small kids, so it's hard to work then. But um, I write every day. I write while I listen to music, uh, which is really weird, but I started studying in law school. I listened to music when I studied and wrote there, and so it's just been like a, a leftover. Sometimes I write alone in my home office. Sometimes I write in the middle of you know, a coffee shop or like a wherever I write in the parking lot of my daughter's dance studio and the lawn chair. So I'm like known as the lady who sits in her lawn chair in the parking lot of the dance studio. And uh, I feel that I can write anywhere as long as I've got my ears covered and I'm like getting in the zone. Um, I can get very distracted, but it, not if I've got music going. But for all the aspiring writers, I wish more people would write I, I wish we're missing out on all that you have to say and all the stories you have to tell. I, I think more people should write and just 
yes, there's an incredible amount of rejection. It's very humiliating for a very long time, but who cares? Just keep writing because I, um, I want to read your stories. I want, I, I'm always interested in what people can tell me. So keep writing, write every day, every single day. Don't even when you go on vacation, bring your laptop. And even if you write for like a half an hour, do it. Yeah, I definitely agree with everything um, you said, especially about just just hanging in there. I swear that the people who get published are mostly the people who just persevere. You just keep going. And eventually, like, I think that was always my attitude is like, maybe it's just growing up where I did. But I was like, I guarantee that they're going to bend before I do. Like, I know <laughs> I will keep going. <laughs> I will keep pursuing this. And like, just eventually, right, I will break through. Um, and I also write with music. It's a very important part of my uh, sort of daily routine. I listen mostly to, to instrumental stuff. Mm -hmm. I find that lyrics will sometimes like get too much of my attention. So I listen to a lot of um, like film soundtracks and video game soundtracks. So just nice, um, nice, like simple music. Uh, and yeah, that's generally the first thing I do. I've listened to some of the songs for so long that it's almost like Pavlovian at this point. Like if I start that song, it automatically will help me move into that frame of mind, which mm -hmm. I highly recommend any trick, any carrot on the end of the stick that you can kind of use to help yourself get into that sort of writing space. And I think my, a lot of my approach changes I wish that it stayed the same, um, but I keep giving myself different challenges and which require different things from me, you know, day to day. So, you know, with the book that I'm working on now, it's the first thing I've ever written that's historical. It's set in the 1850s. And that has really shifted my process. It's a lot more, I'm used to showing up every day, writing, um, really moving forward, you know, and with this one, there's, it's a lot more stop and start, you know, sometimes I'll have to pause to do some research or to think about something because the research can really sort of shift a whole character or shift a whole moment. You know, it's not just facts. It's like the feeling of it. And like, there can be like a little metaphor that you'll find or something that, you know, can ripple through the whole book. So it's been a learning process. <laughs> I'm not, I don't love don't love the pace of the writing historical, but I really love the book and the character. So I'm hanging in there with it. But yeah, I think I think I keep adapting and changing, um, which is probably good for me in the long run. You know, it keeps it fresh. But yeah, I think also being willing to to just grow with your writing and, and not not be afraid that something's wrong or broken if it changes, right? If, if it changes with you as you're going, it's probably a good thing, right? You're just, you're, you're different. And so your writing and your process will also be different. Yeah, well said. I, and I admire you for doing something historical. I love historical fiction, but I, um, I don't know if I've got the gumption to, to tackle it. I, I don't know. I mean, I, in, in a dream world, I would be doing what you're doing right now, but I feel like I get well, I would get too off, too off track, and then it wouldn't be historical fiction anymore. It would just be I just made it, but um, yeah, yeah, that was I can't wait to read it. I'm excited. I mean, it took me two books to work up the nerve. I had to write two like contemporary books before I could do it. So maybe a couple books from now we'll get you know a historical from you. <laughs> I might I might let you know I'm, I'm working on it. <laughs> That was wonderful answers from both of you. Thank you. Um, and thank you so much for the encouragement just to writers to kind of say like, you know, keep keep going. I feel like that's just no writer can ever hear that enough. <laughs> so it's good to hear it. I have a question um, for, for both of the authors. My question is, I'm not gonna say like top, but I'm gonna say someone in your top five people, an author who you don't know personally, um, dead or alive, who is like the dream, you know, conversation, 20 minute conversation about like writing, um, who would it be? Alice Monroe. I mean, I would read it. Like I've said, I've said before, if she wrote her grocery lists, I mean, I would read them. She could, she would like write down like her back pain and I would want to be able to tell me about your back pain. Um, she's, I've read like every word. And some of it many times. Uh, I just, uh, I mean, she's one of many, but I, she's always who first comes to mind because I really, really, really love her work. That's, that's a good answer. Um, 
Louise Erdrich is always that person for me who jumps just immediately to the front of my mind. I think there's so many things that she does that astound me, you know, and that just, you know, she's one of those writers that when I read it, I'm like, I fall in love with writing all over again. And I fall in love with story. And I'm so like, I'm also just like, God, how, how does she do it? Like, how does she do the things that she does? So I think I would just, I would just love to just kind of sit at her feet (laughs) and just learn as much as I possibly could from her. Wonderful. But I mean, those are both like excellent, oh, excellent responses. And I want to point out that uh, The Floating Girls was said to be, you know, a, a good book for fans of Louise Erdrich, which is very exciting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, you, but you you have a lot of her too. So that's interesting. Um, I've only ever read The Roundhouse, but yeah, you're, uh, yeah. I'm not surprised to hear you say that at all. So yeah, that's cool. What about you, Margo? I, I always have to know what who's your favorite writer. Uh, it would probably be Rachel Cusk. Okay. I would wanna, I would wanna, she wrote the Outline trilogy, and I I think she would probably be be somewhat um somewhat taciturn. Perhaps not very interested in talking about herself. So it might be unfulfilling once once we got there. But um, that is who I would love to just like have 20 minutes with and be like, how do you do it? I want to do it. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that's yeah, I take it though that you write as well. Are you a writer? I am. Yeah, I write nonfiction, though. I write creative nonfiction. So mm-hmm. Cusk is like a little she what my favorite of her stuff is the nonfiction, but even her fiction is very nonfiction-y. It kind of has this like nonfiction-y quality. Um and maybe like Joan Didion too. Joan Didion did both, but yeah, but her we missed our chance. We missed our chance. Yeah. I know. I'm I'm a huge Didion fan too. That's another one I've read. I've read some of it several times. It's just so profound. Thanks for the comments and the side though. I just, I just saw, thank you. Um, Absolutely. I, so I'll just use the last four minutes cause I'm not gonna give you back any of your time. We're gonna take all of the time that we were promised um, and ask um, for Lo and also for Ashley um, cause you're into your career, but still um, I'm sure the memories don't go away. What is the most unexpected thing? Often when we're writers, like getting a book published is something that you've worked towards for a long time. Um, and that you know we have a lot of narratives about what it looks like and what it's gonna feel like. And I wonder what is the thing that you didn't expect um, it to be that it ended up being when you finally did publish um, your first book? Um. I think that, and I mean, I hope I don't live to regret saying this, but the kindness, I think that the publishing industry is actually a very kind industry. Um, I hope both of you feel that way. Um, every, I mean, everyone I've dealt with, it's been, I worked in the entertainment business in Los Angeles for a long time. And it's, uh, I don't know that I, I didn't realize how ugly or cutthroat it can be. Um, and I guess I just expected publishing to be like that. I expected it to be very, I mean, it, there is still a ton of rejection. There's a ton of no thank you. There's a ton of door slammed in your face. Like, you know, not literally, but you know, well, this is just not going to work out or, um, I mean, there's all of that, but I felt everyone is usually pretty nice about it. They're, they're nice about everything. And I was very, um, I'll say scared of the editing process with an editor at a, you know, at a, at a publisher and what I, and it's, they're wonderful. Um, the woman I worked with, Erin McClary was just, just wonderful. I mean, I would consider her a friend. And so really the, how kind and gentle I thought the whole process was when I expected to be, you know, like, you know, wrung out and like, you know, and it, it's not like that at all. Um, it wasn't for me. Like I said, I hope I don't live to, somebody's going to say, my God, you know, no, I don't know what you're talking about. Um, I hope that I did not have an unusual experience. I hope that I had a typical experience because if the industry is, that is typical of the industry, then it, then it's a great industry. Um, and I appreciated and was surprised by the kindness. Yeah, I wouldn't, I would definitely second that. I think, you know, I don't know if we're lucky or <laughs> if that's just how it is, but yeah, I think 
every person I met, every bookstore event, every library event, every, you know, each of the little sort of things that I encountered, um, just incredibly warm and supportive. Um, and I think probably the thing that surprised me or that I'm still adjusting to is, is the sense of time as a writer. I think it, I think you operate on a different scale of time. Um, Cause you know, my first book came out in 2020 and there are people who are still reading it for the first time and sending me messages about it. And so although I've like let it go, it's life happens on a different timeline than mine. And we get to sort of intersect sometimes in these really beautiful ways. And it's just, I knew as a reader, you know, like I've read some things um, from Ursula Le Guin for the first time in the last couple of years, you know, and I'm, I'm thinking like, here it is like her life given or her work given life anew. And now I get to be on the other side of that and see my work. Um, yeah, just keep living. And I think there's something really heartening about it and really lovely that um, I didn't know how it would feel, but I liked that feeling. Oh, that's cool, Ashley. Very cool. Both really wonderful, really, really beautiful answers. Um, I love that the experience of the publishing world was like a, a warm one and in and a kind one. Um, I like to I like to think that it has been my experience too. Just like working in a bookshop and be, it has that you know it sort of has as is a warm and encouraging place, and that most people who are in it are in it for the love mm -hmm. of the thing, um, which helps a lot. And um, I, Ashley, I just love to hear that, you know, you let some, you put something in the world and then you kind of get to see what happens with it. What a beautiful notion. Um, and we keep all those things in the world and we put them in our bookshop yeah. and <laughs> we collect them. Um, thank you both so much. This was really a privilege to be able to listen in in this conversation. Um, everybody, buy your book. Click the button at the bottom of the screen and please know that this conversation will live here at this link. So if you have friends, family, anyone you think might be interested, but you couldn't make it tonight, um, the recording will be here. You can direct them here. It'll also be on the Hub City Writers Project's YouTube page. Um, so you can send them there. And that is everything. I'm sad to see the end of this conversation, but thank you to both of the authors again. And I hope everyone has a wonderful evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.